Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, thank you for joining me here this morning and welcoming the Navy's 31st Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral John Richardson, to discuss the Navy the nation needs. The Navy maintains a constant enduring presence of almost 100 ships and submarines four deployed around the globe to deter potential adversaries, reassure our allies, and ensure the freedom of the global maritime commons for all nations. The challenges facing the 21st century Navy have never been greater. As a formidable as these security threats are, there are those who would argue that the greatest challenge to our nation's Navy has come from our own Congress. Over the decade of continuing resolutions and fiscal constraints of the Budget Control Act have had a cumulative effect of degrading the capacity, capabilities, and readiness of the U.S. Navy. In light of these increasingly complex maritime security environment and the recently released National Defense Strategy, CNO's discussion today could not be more timely. As a retired submariner myself, I'm greatly honored to be able to host the CNO today. I too was also a physics major, and uh, we also share another common, uh, common uh, piece in our history that Admiral will talk about. Uh, Admiral John Richardson, graduate from the United States Naval Academy in 1982 with a Bachelor of Science in Physics. He holds master degrees in electrical engineering from MIT and Woods Hole, and national security strategy from the National War College. At sea, Al Richardson served on numerous submarines and commanded USS Honolulu and was awarded the Vice Admiral Stockdale Award for his time in command. Thanks. Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much. I want to thanks, Tom. Thanks for that generous introduction. Yeah. And we do go way back, as Tom uh, alluded to. Uh, back to the Naval Academy, fellow physics majors. I copied Tom's papers a lot to get to, <laughs> through here. And also rode together. So uh, it's just a lot of time staring at each other, the back of each other's heads uh, in the boat. So Tom, I also want to thank you and the foundation for being so flexible uh, with our schedule and, and putting this event together. And uh, I'll tell you what, in terms of events, there are, as I've said in a couple of other times, there's sort of, they, they go in three categories, right? You get a lot of invitations, a uh, remarkable number of invitations, and there are some that uh, you don't want to do when you're not going to do. You just sort of say no. And then there are some that uh, you'd rather not do, but you probably have to do, and so you say yes reluctantly. But then there are some that you really sort of out, you know, shop it around for, that you really want to do. And this was one of those events. I really am eager to be here, and I want to blast through, given I'm just looking around the crowd, there's a, people who know as much or more about naval strategy than I do in the crowd, and I want to get through my remarks as quickly as possible, get to the uh, question and answer period, which I think will be uh, a lot of fun. And again, you know, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here uh, at Heritage, who's, you know, the, the, the foundation itself has a, uh, has just a, a firm reputation for supporting national security and the Navy in particular. Just start before I get uh, into my remarks about just a quick operational update as I speak to you now. My brief this morning showed that we have uh, 92 ships forward deployed in the United States Navy today, about 60,000, a little more than 60,000 sailors uh, forward deployed. Uh, that includes uh, two underway carrier strike groups. And of course, the Ronald Reagan carrier strike group, uh, the four deployed strike group in Japan. Uh, two amphibious ready groups with their embarked Marine Expeditionary Unit. Uh, of course, those strike groups come with their embarked air wing, which is really the fighting arm of the, of, uh, the carrier. Uh, 14 attack submarines uh, are deployed today, which is a bit of a high point. You know, our, our normal. Uh, Force offering there is uh, between 10 and 12 normally. SSBNs on patrol as they have been 100% of the time since 1960. And uh, that, you know, that's an important part. Maintaining that, uh, that alert status is an important part of our program going forward. And we have six uh, cruisers and destroyers on BMD station. So as uh, Tom said, our discussion today comes at a critical time. Uh, for our Navy as we face a very dynamic and changing maritime environment. And it comes on the cusp of some important sort of annual events as well as we get ready to release the budget for 19. Obviously, we won't discuss the details of that here until that's released, uh, but uh, it, it will be 
talking about some of the strategic underpinning that uh, informs that budget. And as we're talking about strategy, another uh, realization, a reality is that the national security strategy has just been recently released, as has the national defense strategy just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and Secretary Mattis in that strategy provides a much needed framework. In fact, if you think about the Navy, the nation needs, and you know, there's sort of an ellipsis at the end, uh, you know, dot, dot, for what? Well, the Navy, the nation needs to fulfill the maritime responsibilities in the national defense strategy, right? So we have one strategy for the department, that is the NDS. And this could be seen almost as, you know, part of the maritime component of uh, that strategy. So we're using the tagline, the nation the Navy needs. So uh, as I said, we'll get through a quick discussion of the security environment, and then we'll get to questions. And so I thought I would uh, throw up a couple of charts. I don't want to get too heavy into the charts. Um, this room looks a lot bigger on the pictures, but uh, so it's kind of an intimate setting. <laughs> I don't feel too bad uh, spending some time on a couple of charts. And if you look at a map of the world, uh, well, this isn't an uncommon you know, format for that uh, depiction, right? And so you see uh, you know, a lot of geography, right? Most of the uh, political maps that you see are maps that focus on the land part of the globe. And so you've got both the political and geographic things represented here, uh, cities, towns, roads, those sorts of features. Not uncommon, as I said. And then there's this you know, blue stuff that uh, connects it. And I will tell you that this is kind of how I see it. right? And so I start with the blue. In fact, it's not that. That's just the template on which I see it. Uh, I see it more like that, okay? which is a depiction of just how busy things are in the maritime and getting busier all the time. So we'll we'll talk in the context of the return to great power competition this morning. And uh, you know, by virtue of you know, that word return, we'll go back to the last time we were in uh, great power competition and just make some comparisons. Because I would say this, it's just not you know, a rerun of that last time. And in the, I would say the last time we were in great power competition was on the order of about 25 years ago, right? The, the Cold War. Um, since that time, in the, in the last 25 years or so, maritime traffic, just ships on the ocean, has increased 400%. And if you consider the fact that people have been going to sea for tens of thousands of years, right? 10,000 years is probably not a bad estimate. Uh, to see a four-fold increase in the last quarter century. You know, just think about what that means for us in terms of just managing that amount of traffic. And it's fueled the uh, roughly doubling of the, of the GDP of the globe, right? So a lot of that, uh, of, uh, of that uh, prosperity has been manifested and enabled by maritime traffic. Megacities continue to grow uh, expected to be grow from 31 to 41 by 2030. The vast majority of those megacities within 100 miles of the coastline. We're turning to the sea more and more for our food, our sustenance, both carbohydrate and protein. And aquaculture, as it's called, is, has uh, increased 13-fold and is expected to continue that way going into the uh, future. Uh, I don't know if this have a, a laser. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, uh, on this chart are depicted a number of things. So you can see in white, there are the sea lanes. These diamond shapes are just uh, another feature of the dy dynamism in the maritime domain, uh, as is are the purple shaded areas, uh, are, which is uh, technology has given us access to resources on the seafloor that we just simply never had before. Okay, And so now we've got access to uh, oil, natural gas, other natural resources, minerals. Uh, the, the lines that run roughly parallel to the sea lanes, but they're colored in gold or orange, uh, signify the undersea cable network. Okay? This is this uh, network, this infrastructure that's undersea, on which rides about 99% of international internet traffic. Okay? And so uh, when we talk about a cloud, 
we're really looking in the wrong direction from my standpoint, right? It's you cloud, you look up, it's the, the, most of that information is in the sea. We should be talking about a lake, okay? So help me there. I'm just trying to change this whole, <laughs> you know, not cloud computing, lake computing, okay? And then uh, another thing that's depicted here are the, uh, the polar ice caps up uh, near the top of the uh, chart. And those are the smallest they've been in that period of time, in that 25 years since the last time we've been in great power competition, giving rise to, again, access to more resources, giving rise to sea lanes of communication that simply just weren't there uh, uh, before. And so given these dynamics in the maritime and others, uh, a balanced strategy, a, a balanced strategic approach is more important than ever. And our priorities have been very clearly defined by the national security strategy, which directs us to uh, protect America, promote American prosperity, preserve peace through strength, and advance American influence through the world, throughout the world. And the national defense strategy picks up, describes the imperative for confronting these challenges to you know, challenges head on, right? We're gonna compete, we're gonna deter, and we're gonna win. Centered on three major lines of effort, which are to build a more lethal force, to continue to strengthen our alliances and even attract new partners, so, so expand and deepen those alliances, and then uh, to look to uh, do reform the department in terms of the way that we do our business and acquire the material with which we, uh, with which we do our business. And so this is also the, uh, the handing off point, right? The Navy, the nation needs, picks up that, uh, that agenda, that, that call to action. And uh, I wanna talk in terms, just quickly, in terms of how I see uh, defining naval power, all right? And there's been a good consensus, including the consensus by the Heritage Foundation and other, many other studies over the last uh, roughly two years that have all converged on the conclusion that we, the Navy needs, that we need more naval power to meet our responsibilities to the nation, okay? And so I wanna talk about the concept of naval power. I'm gonna break it down into a few dimensions, dimensions that hang together, all right? It's very difficult to talk about coherent naval power if you start stripping these out and, uh, and, and disconnect them from one another. You must keep them in balance to provide this sense of integrity or wholeness. And so one dimension is just to, one way to increase uh, naval power is just to build a bigger fleet, okay? And a number of those studies that I alluded to talk about that capacity. And in fact, all of those studies converged on a Navy in the neighborhood of 300, 355 ships. Our force structure assessment did that, and there were a number of other studies that went that, and the Congress picked up on that, and the National Defense Authorization Act has a statement in there that we will do everything we can to achieve a 355 uh, ship Navy uh, subject to appropriation and authorization and all those things. And so this idea of the numbers of platforms, right, not a great leap of intuition that a bigger Navy is a more powerful Navy. A second component, a second dimension of naval power would be to build a better fleet. And so if you modernize each one of those platforms and, and other ways uh, with better systems, make each one of those things more capable, then that means you know, each one being more capable, but they sum up also to more naval power, a more capable fleet. And we're actually on the cusp of some you know, very intriguing technologies that would not only increase our capability, I would think, uh, you know, very much, but also could do so and get us you know, on the correct side of the cost curve. And so I'm looking uh, hard at things like directed energy, uh, high power microwave, lasers, electromagnetic maneuver warfare, and other uh, innovative ways. Also in this uh, group, uh, you know, this, this uh, uh, you know, better fleet, this capability dimension, we might want to consider things like unmanned. And so depending upon how we think about unmanned, some of those unmanned platforms may be kind of in the platform dimension, many of them here in the capability dimension. And so we're looking uh, you know, hard at uh, building out our family of unmanned underwater systems, surface systems, and air systems. 
third dimension of power as we enable power as we think about it is to take those platforms with their uh, inherent capability, which we can increase, and then network them together. So this third uh, component is a network fleet. So we have sort of a bigger fleet, a more capable fleet, and now a network fleet. And there are plenty of examples in history where just the power of networking things together creatively, adaptively, uh, brings actually more power to that force. And so we can talk about some of those historical uh, examples. And, but it makes intuitive sense as well, right? It sort of checks with the chart that if you're able to share data more uh, across the force, you're able to respond to that awareness with more agility, uh, and it, you, you can be a more powerful fleet. Uh, not talked about enough is uh, what I'll call the fourth dimension, which is a more talented fleet. And if you think about the, you know, growing these other dimensions, growing naval power, at some point we're gonna have to man that fleet with sailors. And so there's also sort of a number of sailors dimension, but also the skill sets with which those sailors are going to need different than the ones that uh, we have right now, right? And so particularly as you think about, well, let's talk, go back to that network fleet, right? We're talking about uh, sharing and, try and assimilating, uh, sifting through uh, you know, vast amounts of data that come from uh, growing sets or networks and the such. And so, you know, as we get, uh, you know, a bigger fleet, okay, we're going to need more sailors. As we get a better fleet, we're going to need sailors that are trained a little bit differently than we train them right now. Those systems demand different skills. As we consider a network fleet, we're going to need some help, right? And so this is the realm of artificial intelligence, of learning algorithms, of uh, figuring out the optimum way to team together the people, our sailors, and uh, machine assistants, okay, to be able to sort through that amount of data and get to those decision relevant uh, bits of information as quickly as possible. Competing in that uh, orient and decide part of the OODA loop, right, so that we can, uh, we can beat the competition in that part of that loop. Fifth dimension, is uh, what I'm calling the Agile fleet. This is an appreciation for the concepts of operations with which we operate that fleet. The C2 structures with which we command and control that fleet. And so once we have built this fleet, we've modernized it, we've networked it, we've manned it with the appropriately trained sailors with the assistance they need, We've got to figure out uh, how we're going to operate it. And there's always, as you know, a dynamic tension between sort of the technology that's, a, that's available to the fleet and the con ops with which we operate that fleet. And so those two, I don't know if it's a tension, maybe it's an interplay is a better way to describe it. As more uh, possibilities you know, become evident uh, through technology, you, you, then you adapt your con ops, that feeds back to the technology space to say, if I only had this, I could do so much more. And so there's a great uh, reinforcing dynamism. And so, as we consider things like distributed maritime operations, we're really looking for a, a fleet that much more leverages the global maneuver power that is inherent in a Navy, right? And so as you think about this type of an environment, you know, it's the only thing that really structures that environment are you know, natural choke points, okay? So in, and some of those have been around since the United States Navy started 242 years ago. And you can see them up there, Gibraltar, the Suez, the Babo Mendev, the Strait of Hormuz, the Strait of Malacca. Uh, all of these choke points sort of define our structures. What it is not responsive to is artificial lines, right? So combatant commander boundaries and those sorts of things. We have to make sure that we, we preserve the inherent uh, agility of the Navy as it maneuvers. We don't think so much in terms of where a particular uh, naval capability is, right? But uh, not only where it is, but then it's only a few days away from wherever it might need to be, okay? There's this idea of tethers rather than you know, a one or a zero presence, all right? And then final dimension, oh, this is getting complicated, so uh, the only thing I could have done worse is to have every one of these things on a slide, so. Uh, uh, so the, the final dimension is, you know, everything I've talked about right now is sort of a fleet in being potential energy, if you will. 
until you get that force out and you train it and you, this is the ready fleet, okay? And so uh, turning all of that potential power, that potential energy into kinetic energy requires uh, readiness. And that means you gotta go out, you've gotta steam, you've gotta fly. You've got to have your uh, magazines full. You've got to have your logistics uh, element in place. You've got to have your parts. You've got to do the maintenance. You know, all of those things uh, bring that fleet to light, if you will, and, and turn it into actual, uh, actual energy, actual fleet capability. And so I hope you know, I've painted a, a picture then of, of naval power composed of elements. And uh, it is that wholeness, right? It's a, uh, w w w unless you have all those elements present, you're not talking the full you know, dimensionality of naval power, all right? And if you think about just naval power you, uh, in its entirety, it, it uh, moves us away from some of these, I would call them false choices that uh, we often get tangled up in in our conversations, right? So if we think about, you know, capacity versus capability, okay? Uh, well, certainly there may be some trade-offs there, but they both contribute to naval power, right? They're both needed to, uh, to be truly powerful in the maritime domain. Um, Standalone technologies versus network, right? Mission command versus network uh, command. Uh, it's both, and you've got to navigate your way in that space uh, dynamically. Okay, and so there's these, there's these trade-offs that when you think in terms of naval power, uh, we, we can elevate our thinking above these false choices and, and concentrate on what's important. It's like the, nu I'm gonna just go nuke on you for a little, it's like the nucleus of an atom, right? And uh, you know, if you've got the pure element, right, all the parts of that nucleus are there. And so if you think about those six dimensions, a bigger fleet, a better fleet, a network fleet, a more talented fleet, an agile fleet with agile uh, concepts of operations, agile command and control, and then a ready fleet. Those are the components of the nucleus. If you try and tear one out, you don't have naval power. You have some isotope of naval power, right? Something that's close, but not really complete. And as you all know, because I know you've done your nuclear homework, you know, these isotopes are sometimes unstable, Sometimes they decay, et cetera, right? It's not the stable element that we want, not the true thing. Okay, as we talk about st strategy here, sort of a strategic overview, the strategic components of naval power, uh, you know, my aim is to sort of give you a view th through the telescope, right? Not the microscopes. Too often we try and get down into the microscopic detail, and you can miss the uh, strategic direction of the strategic the strategic imperative. And as long as we're doing that, I think we do need to take a step back and appreciate another dimension that uh, we have to contend with. Tom alluded to it, and it is, well, we can just sort of summarize it by appreciating the last uh, 18 months of fiscal year 17 and 18. And during that time, we have the longest CR and the fourth longest CR. We have two continuing resolutions in that period of time both of which in the top five in terms of length, one of them the longest of all time. Uh, during that 18 months, we've operated five months with an enacted budget. The rest of the time has been on continuing resolutions. Currently have really no top line and a government shutdown, okay? Just uh, uh, went through that. This type of uh, dynamism also impacts strategic planning and degrades the industrial base and has a strategic uh, effect on uh, not only the Navy the nation needs, but the uh, national security that we need. And most importantly, perhaps, I will tell you that working through this squanders the most precious resource, which is time, okay? We are spending time managing through this churn rather than getting on with the strategic direction we need to maintain. Okay. Before I come to a close, I talked about command and control. As we move into this uh, great power competition, as we build a more lethal Navy, uh, as we build more ships, with more advanced technology, talented sailors, none of those by themselves are sufficient to respond to today's complex challenges 
without commanding officers of ships that are focused on competition, focused on building teams that can go out there and compete and win. And so just as we have done throughout our history, we're going to continue to focus on developing commanding officers who are almost literally obsessed with building winning teams, teams that can compete and win again and again on a sustainable basis. But that is our business. Right? As I said at the Surface Navy Association, in many ways I envy uh, our, our, our uh, sister services, our ground services, because they can go to places like Gettysburg and they can walk the ground. And, and so many of the features of that battle are still resident there. And you can see the terrain of just say, for instance, Pickett's Charge, Little Round Top, et cetera. In our business, the winners sink and the losers sail away. And in our business, we want to be that Navy that sails away. So let there be no doubt, in uh, times of triumph, times of turbulence, rough seas, calm seas, our Navy's operating around the world to secure our interests, protect America from attack, protect our prosperity, our influence around the world, ensure our way of life, which has always been linked to the sea in the United States. We are a maritime nation. and We hope that by virtue of this construct, we will build the Navy the nation needs, uh, a safe Navy for our sailors, a reassuring Navy for our partners, and a lethal Navy for our enemies. So with that, that's the end of my prepared remarks, and I am eager to take your questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, some wonderful remarks there, uh, again, focusing on the national defense strategy and uh, your six dimensions there. Um, so kind of following up on that, one of the things I see, you know, re hearing your remarks and having read the, the public version of national defense strategy and on your piece for an a, a more agile uh, CONOPS, do you see in what the guidance says is increased operational predictability, this dynamic force employment, military posture and operations, um, how do you see this driving how the Navy is going to train, train, uh, train and deploy, you know, and do you see this changing how we kind of forward deploy some of our forces both in the uh, Pacific and in, you know, the Europe region? Did you say dynamic predictability or unpredictability? Uh, unpredictability. Yeah. So I think that uh, going forward, again, you, you sort of keep that naval power thing as your, your, your north star. And so as we uh, move forward, uh, one, you know, one of the things that we're going to focus on is making sure that whichever forces we deploy, for whatever missions they are assigned, they're going to be you know, completely ready and certified to be able to go off and do those missions, right? So we'll establish sort of the, uh, the maximum level of forces that we can generate and offer to the combatant commanders. And then in terms of how we employ that force once it's out there, very fast moving uh, train you know, in, in this regard. And so as we uh, train, certify, and deploy strike groups, you know, some of it goes back to some of these con ops and technology that they're bringing with them, really uh, a, a very dynamic environment as we move forward into this, you know, this new competitive uh, arena that we're, we're entering. And then in terms of, uh, I think that unpredictability you know, for, for our competitors is good as long as you know, it's sort of strategic uh, predictability on the, and, and end up reassuring, you know, our allies and partners. So we'll just have to, you know, figure out how that goes. Always with this, you know, becoming sort of a more lethal, more reassuring Navy as our, as our, guiding, uh, our guiding force there. Thank you, sir. Um, another thing that ties into what you said of all these, of, of the nucleus and having all the parts that you have to do. Was that too um, much? Was that too technical? Like no, I, 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 I was geeking out on it, sir. So <laughs> I... Some of, some of the uh, audience may not have, but... Um, Megan, I know, but she, she followed the <laughs> right, okay, right, okay. Um, But it follows up, so, you know, Chairman Whitman, uh, you know, wrote an op-ed in, in Navy Times a couple of days ago. One of the things he tied in there, he said that the Navy needs more ship, more resources, and more time to complete maintenance and training in order to operate the necessary pace the Navy requires, right? The, the administration um, and Congress have both supported the 355 ships, as you said, so we need a bigger Navy. Um, but also, as you've seen, 
right? We need to store that fleet readiness. Um, those two demands, you know, kind of both in, in the resources piece, um, how do you see yourself able to, working with SecNav, to, to both to simultaneously build the fleet and restore readiness and provide that time? Right, so, uh, well, first of all, the Secretary of the Navy has been, you know, completely, uh, I mean, he's actually out in front of this, right? So he's leading us down this path. And so it's been uh, just terrific uh, to get to know him more and to work closely with him and to, to you know, sort of make his vision real. Uh, and as we do that, it is sort of a, uh, you've got to keep this, this concept of wholeness in mind. So as we build more naval capacity, right, with that comes the need to make, keep that whole, right? And so uh, the, the only other uh, consequence is that we, we build something. If we don't in, integrate that wholeness from the beginning, it just becomes sort of a latent bill later on, right? Uh, for the really, you know, down uh, at the waterfront, at the fleet commander level, they have to deal with that imbalance. And so we've taken on, uh, you know, a much more holistic approach to putting that program together, always mindful that as we increase capacity, as we increase capability, the rest of those, you know, other five dimensions, if you will, you know, the readiness has got to come with it. We've got to invest in that as part of the total ownership cost of, of the Navy. Um, and tie on. So, I'm sorry, this gets to that isotope thing, right? If we start to disassociate those, we end up with, uh, with problems, right? Uh, things that are built that aren't uh, ready to go. Yes, I understand. We've been there, you know, not enough sailors and modernization. Um, and to tie up one of the, what you said about the five of 18 months, you know, with, uh, that we only had a budget the rest of the time under a continuing resolution. And in some of your recent testimony, you said, on, you know, on a scale of one to ten, you said stable and adequate funding was a, was an eleven right. on that piece. Um, are there some key uh, um, issues that have had of the impact of even the current CR on maintenance and ship recurrent you see in fiscal year eighteen? And uh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, maintenance might be one of the things that takes uh, one of the biggest hits. Uh, uh, I mean, doing particularly deep maintenance on a naval vessel, that, that's, a big, that's a big undertaking, right? It, it requires planning, it requires uh, anticipating. You gotta get started on that early to do it right, to get, to hire the appropriate workers, to buy the appropriate material. All of those things that go into properly maintaining, and, and we do a lot of modernization in those upkeeps as well, to keep those ships relevant in the threat environment they, uh, they operate in. And so, uh, when you have these sort of fits and starts, these uncertainties, uh, you can't write a contract unless you've got the funding to back that up. And so these sorts of things really slide right. They kind of bow wave to the right. And uh, again, you know, you sort of lose that most precious resource, which is time. And so, uh, you know, planning can get, can get shortchanged. Uh, the materials don't come at the optimum cost. Workers are very difficult to hire. Uh, and, and some of the talented workers say, hey, listen, this, isn't, this is just too volatile for me, and I'm going to go someplace where it's a little bit more stable. And so a lot of that talent leaves the workforce and may not come back. And so it's, it really starts to have a, uh, a toxic effect. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, and I think most of, a lot of the average public doesn't understand the impact of taking these operational ships out of commission for maintenance periods for sometimes years at a time really reduces that number you have available to deploy. No, you hit it exactly right. So uh, if you think about naval power, a ship that can't go out to sea because it's not maintained, that's not a ship that's delivering naval power, right, because of that reason. And so, so again, the, you know, the importance of keeping that naval power thing as your front and center goal uh, helps you see that. Great, sir. Um, one thing I'll tie in is uh, that you know, the recent year, uh, the, the issues with the Service Naval Force, uh, you, you had uh, Fleet Forces Command conduct a comprehensive review, um, and SECNAV had the Strategic Readiness Review. Um, and the question I, I have for you is, yourself and now with Vice Admiral Brown, the new Commander of Naval Surface Forces, um, what do you see as the, of, you know, there's a lot of corrective actions, a lot of things that have been already, you've already implemented. What do you see as kind of the, the most important uh, corrective action, I think, to have the, the quickest turn and biggest effect um, of fixing those issues? Yeah, there's a number of things that are kind of moving in parallel. Some of them are moving at different speeds. Some of them are very immediate, sort of, you know, some uh, kind of 
training things that we can do right away. They don't require a lot of investment. They don't require a lot of time. And so we can get at those uh, fairly urgently. And, and in fact, a lot of that is already done. Uh, I, I would, if you back up, uh, I think the idea of uh, identifying and sticking to the process for force generation, you know, the, the maintenance, training, certification strokes that need to happen on a uh, you know, predictable, well, at least a, a, a routine base, right? So you got to stick to that plan, if you will, so that you've got that force generation piece in place uh, before you send uh, those forces to sea to execute missions. I would say that that's sort of the biggest idea. Now, there's a lot of components to making that happen. Uh, there's command and control implications and uh, training implications, et cetera. But I would say that that's sort of the big idea behind the uh, comprehensive review and the strategic readiness review. Thank you, sir. Um, tying into one of the things you said, and, and again, one of your pillars there of this, you know, kind of increasing capability, and I think it also ties into uh, what the National Defense Strategy said, uh, this reforming the department. Um, I guess I would ask for, you know, some of your ideas that you have yourself um, with the new uh, uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research Development Acquisition, Secretary Gertz, and SECNAV of how are you going, what are you implementing, what are things you see to speed up innovation and to field some of these new capabilities more rapidly uh, to the fleet um, that we see how, to, how that's going to happen? So uh, first, you know, Secretary Gertz has brought just a tremendous amount of energy and, and insight into the business uh, coming from SOCOM where he was the acquisition executive down there. So it's been, uh, you know, again, this new team that's forming is uh, really terrific. The uh, things that we have been doing, I would say uh, one of the most important things is that we're starting to have meaningful conversations with uh, industry and uh, the research and development uh, uh, business earlier on in the process, right? So that uh, the idea is uh, that uh, we're just going to have a system that can get to the sweet spot between requirements, what is technically achievable uh, in a at a maturity level where I can make some predictions about cost and schedule that I can stick to. And, and then take that stroke, right? Move, make that move. Uh, that might involve some prototyping and, and those sorts of things. We'll get through that phase fast and then get it to the fleet as fast as we can. So this accelerated acquisition program that we've got. And, uh, and then even as we're delivering that step, Tom, we want to make sure that we are thinking about the next step already, right? And so we get into these fast iterations of capability increase informed by what is technically achievable uh, that allows us to ride that technology curve a lot closer, right? Now, we've got to quicken the pace, right? We've got to be doing those iterative steps a lot more quickly than we are right now. And uh, so we're starting to do that. So as we think about families of underwater uh, unmanned vehicles, families of missile systems where we're, we're, we're moving forward. Uh, the MQ-25, the, our unmanned uh, aircraft, carrier-based aircraft has been moving quickly. I would say that the new frigate is adopting some of those uh, uh, features as well. And then, you know, I look forward to leveraging all of that into a future service combatant. So there's a number of different things uh, that we're doing. This directed energy business uh, that I talked about at the podium, all of those things were kind of in the, the fast lane and uh, uh, using these new uh, techniques. And then, you know, Secretary Gertz is uh, educating us all about, you know, other ways to uh, get this done as well. Tying with that is, you know, specifically you mentioned in, you know, in your remarks talking about um, how artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, man, man, that unmanned teaming, how it can help that OODA loop. Uh, and also the integration of unmanned systems in there. Um, with so much of that work in, in research and development happening in a lot of those systems out in the commercial world, yeah. is uh, how is Navy, the Navy uh, integrating with the commercial industry to bring in their ideas and, and kind of insert their technology? Well, uh, we work with a lot of commercial partners, uh, private sector partners, it just as a matter of, of routine. And so uh, that's not anything new, really. It's bringing the team together earlier is really the key. And so, uh, you know, a model where we would have maybe a set of requirements officers, you know, locked in a room until they come up with their set of requirements, you know, white smoke comes out and, and they come out with, okay, here it is, right? Here's the thing. And uh, uh, 
industry takes a look at that and says, well, that, that's terrific, except there's nothing that can do that right now. <laughs> you know, I, I got to go invent that. Well, that's uh, time and uncertainty and, and translates to money. If you bring sort of the technologists in, then you can do some really good work to, to, to find something that's executable. And, and then again, Tom, you got to have that fast iteration uh, in place as well. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, a very rich part of that, and it's, it's I think, indicative of a, a shift of some parts of the innovation uh, base in the country where it maybe used to be all you know, DOD-led, classified, et cetera. You know, a lot of times the, lead, the leading agents, the, the leading edge of that is out in the commercial sector. Exactly. We just have to be fast followers, fast adopters. And so depending upon what we're talking about, we have to be agile to respond to both. Thank you, sir. So, I don't want to take up all the time with my questions, uh, so I'd like to ask some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so wait for, when you get the microphone, uh, sir, uh, state your name, uh, where you're from, and then your question. And a current giant naval thinker, right, Rami? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't say that, sir. All right, well, I did. Thank, thank you very much, and thank you for your comments today. You, you began, as you uh, often do, by talking about the, the number of ships that are deployed. And roughly, there are about the same number of ships deployed now as there were during the Cold War when we had a Navy that was at least twice as large, if not more than twice as large. And I guess the, the, the essence of my question is going to be, are we trying, I still say we, are we trying to do too much with too little? Mm -hmm. And a few threads there. Uh, Bob Work has, has written and commented over the past several months that we should possibly deploy fewer places, uh, deploy less often, and concentrate on the high-end threat. Um, when Admiral Roden spoke over to SNA uh, a couple of weeks ago, just before you did, he said the, um, the solution to some of the problems that the surface force faces is more ships, but it takes a long time to build more ships, and more time, fewer distractions, or what, I don't know if he used the word distractions, I, word. obligations, I think he said, fewer obligations. Well, I would say an obligation is different than a distraction. Yeah, right. I, and I agree with that, uh, obligations. And then when you spoke a couple of hours later, um, you said one of your responsibilities was to, to I think, to lessen those obligations or maybe to remove distractions. It, it comes down at the end of the day, I think, to doing, doing, not doing too much with too little. How do we free up the, how do we free up the Navy, yeah. as Bob Work has suggested, to concentrate on the high end on the high-end fight. Right. How do we have more time for training to make sure that when the ships do deploy and to deploy to the right place that they're ready to go? So are we trying to do too much with too little? Right, that's a, you know, it's sort of the fundamental question, right? And so some of that, uh, those ratios that you described in terms of number of ships deployed versus the number of force, the ships in the battle fleet, you know, some of that can be achieved because we actually do get more efficient and we build some of that efficiency in and so, but, you know, we're seeing uh, that uh, you got to be careful. You can go too far, right, and you can stretch too thin. And so the art here, uh, and maybe it's not even an art as much as a science, is to figure out, you know, what is that sustainable level? And that's work we're checking right now uh, so that, uh, you know, we don't reach that point where we're, it's an unsustainable pace, right? Uh, so that's, you know, kind of at the, at the, at the greatest, most fundamental level. Uh, generally, what you have in this force generation business is you have you know, a cycle, and the uh, optimized fleet response plan is an example of one of those cycles where you have a period of that cycle where you're preparing and readying the force, and then you have a period of that cycle where the force is ready and certified, and it goes off and sustains that readiness in operational context. And so, uh, again, I go back to naval power, more lethal Navy. Uh, if you think about what we do to employ that force, always with keeping lethal increasing lethality in mind, uh, well, it, it might change how you uh, employ that force. And so uh, if you're going to forward deploy, let's say make sure that we're getting something real, 
you know, measurable out of that time on station, that when we do that, we've got a mind towards maintaining that readiness that we have invested in and built up. And then maybe we bring it back and we do a high-end exercise in the Virginia Capes areas uh, with the aggregated strike group. And you know, the combination of that not only makes us, I think, less predictable, but also in the aggregate might make us uh, more lethal as a, as a, you know, a fighting Navy, uh, particularly at the aggregated level. And then finally, um, you talked about distractions. That can get down to the very personal level, right? So what are my officers, chief petty officers, sailors doing with their time on a day-to-day -day basis? And I want them always coming in thinking about, okay, on their drive into work or as they're getting ready to go on watch at sea, what am I going to do today to confound our, our enemies, our competition? And at the end of the day, as they're driving home or before they put their head down on that rack, they could say, what did I do today, right? And what might I do tomorrow? And if we can remove any distractions from that focus, uh, and this stuff sort of builds up in non-competitive environments or less competitive environments, uh, we really got to you know, cut through that. So we're starting to take a look at the collateral duties that have accumulated and slashing some of those so that we can get our leaders down at the deck plate level, at the personal level, more time to focus on leadership and command and those sorts of things. So you know, all the way from sort of the largest Navy down to sort of the fighting element down to the personal level, we're trying to remove those uh, distractions. Um, but there, Megan. So. Thank you. Megan Eckstein with USNI News. Um, to go back to Tom's question about how the budget environment affects your ability to kind of keep that nucleus together, um, NAVC has talked about how they're now contracting for modernization periods with multiple years money uh, rather than maintenance uh, availabilities where it's only one year money. Are there other ways the Navy's sort of adapting how it does business to keep that nucleus together with the kind of weird budget environment, or are you really stuck in some areas where you just need stable funding? Well, I mean, we do need stable funding, right? Uh, uh, but uh, the system has adapted, Megan, as you know. So, uh, and, and I wouldn't say in completely healthy ways, but sort of ways to just kind of get business done. And so, uh, um, for instance, we don't put a whole lot of important things at risk in the first fiscal quarter, right? <laughs> because we're, we're just, uh, we rarely have a budget there. It's been nine years and we haven't had one. and so. So you know that we, we sort of minimize risk there. We're, we're coming up on Super Bowl week, and I know that there's a lot. Everybody in the room has a position on that uh, competition, but I know that uh, in competition that's that close, you can't expect a team to win if they only play three quarters out of four, right? And that's kind of what our fiscal environment uh, is asking us to do in many ways. Uh, we talked about the time penalty. There's the staffing penalty. A lot of uh, the contracts that we talked about have to be written twice, you know, for those periods of time. And so we're, you know, we're adapting, but it's really, uh, you can do some things, uh, particularly with multi-year money, but we have to be very, you know, we have to have this dialogue with, uh, with Congress and make sure that you know, we just have a meaningful discussion about this so that uh, you know, nobody's surprised. Uh, we have on our side an obligation to you know, prove our our reliability, I suppose, as we move forward. And so you know, we, we do the, the best we can, I think, to try and get after that. Also, uh, going back to this wholeness concept, you know, the way that we bring the program together um, you know, starts with our strategic direction. Uh, and then we've got a, a very integrated approach, which includes keeping that nucleus intact all the way through the process. And then at the end, we, we check our homework. Right? So if we started with a particular vision in mind, it goes through all the machinations. We want to make sure that the thing at the end of that process looks like what we started with. And so that process and getting all of our you know, leadership uh, connected very closely with the fleet helps us to keep that in balance so that when these things happen, we can much more, with much more agility navigate the trade space of uh, you know, whatever uh, the budget environment sends us. One last question. Uh, Miss there in the red. Lee Hudson, Inside the Navy. Um, you mentioned earlier about how Congress authorized 13 ships in FY18. And I was hoping you could talk I'm about. I'm not sure I did say that, but. Uh, anyway. Oh, I thought you did, that they put in, but they didn't appropriate the funding. 
thought that's what you said. But anyway, so I wanted to hear the concrete steps the Navy has actually taken to grow the fleet. And I know that the president, you know, mentioned on the campaign trail the 350 ship Navy. If you could get us uh, examples of that. Well, I think uh, a lot of that is pending, right? So uh, when we get an 18 budget and then, you know, the subsequent budgets, we'll just, I think that's news still to come. I mean, it'd be premature to talk about it now. Uh, one last question. Um, yeah, the gentleman right there. Sure. We'll wait for that. Uh, so you spoke at length a little bit about strategy towards the end of your prepared remarks there. Uh, Two-part question with that. Where, you know, you talked about um, cho you know, maritime choke points. Uh, one of the most important ones is the GI-UK gap, uh, which I know is one of the issues that uh, the Navy faces right now is it is vastly under uh, – understaffed at the moment and there's not really uh, a NATO strategy at the moment with regards to the North Atlantic to combat um, you know incursions from the Bering Sea and so I was curious where that plays into uh, the strategy going forward and then also where does the LCS program and the Zumwalt uh, destroyer program going forward uh, play into making that more technologically advanced Navy but also one that obviously is uh, prepared going forward to meet those agile uh, fast, agile requirements, which you mentioned as well. Okay, so two completely different questions. It's not a two-part <laughs> question. It's really just two questions. That's well, fair. well played. Um, well, I, I will tell you, with respect to the North Atlantic and uh, sort of the resurgent uh, Russia uh, challenge, I, you know, I, I don't know if I would agree that we're vastly understaffed for that. Uh, you know, particularly in undersea forces, which is you know the GIUK gap. But that's what you're talking about there. Uh, you know, we enjoy a, a window of superiority that's really fact and evidence-based. Uh, NATO, I think, is addressing these challenges as well. And so, uh, you know, I talk uh, very often with uh, both General Scaparotti and Clive Johnstone, uh, MARCOM, and so that's a dynamic and responsive environment to this emerging threat in the maritime domain. And so I'm actually uh, pretty optimistic that that is responding with agility. Uh, with respect to these combatants that you mentioned, uh, they've got a big part in our future Navy, both the uh, LCS, small service combatant moving to a frigate, and then uh, also the Zumwalt. And so uh, both from a technological standpoint in terms of moving us forward, but also in an operational employment standpoint, uh, we've, you know, we've done a lot to rationalize the LCS program, make each one of those th uh, platforms you know, as lethal as we can. Uh, they're going to play important parts of our Navy going forward. Each one has, uh, has become more capable on delivery with fewer problems. Uh, so we're coming through the engineering and uh, design issues. And uh, you know, as we do with every single new shipbuilding program, we sort of learn our way forward. Uh, and so those are going to play a big role, uh, particularly with that agility part. And, they're gonna, and each one of those platforms plays its role in the team, right? So... Uh, we don't need to make every ship do everything, right? Uh, and so they'll be employed sort of consistent with their capability, okay? All right, well, that's it. we're out of time today, but I thank, I thank the Admiral for coming today. All right, thanks, Tom. And uh, I thank uh, everyone in the audience for joining us today. All right, thanks.